So the next uh, speaker uh, I'm pleased to introduce, partially because she is a faculty member here at the University of Chicago. Uh, Kathleen Morrison is Professor of Anthropology and Social Sciences in the college. She received her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in 1992 and her MA from the University of New Mexico in 1987. Professor Morrison has directed and carried out archaeological research for more than 20 years. And although her primary area of interest is southern India, she has also worked in Sri Lanka, the Pacific, and western North America. Her research integrates paleoenvironmental analysis, including pollen, microscopic charcoal, stable isotope, and sediment analysis, archaeological survey and excavation, and the analysis of text and architecture. Her work, thus, is interdisciplinary and combines data and methods from the social sciences, the natural sciences, and the humanities. Particular research interests include the development of elite cuisines, colonialism and imperialism, agricultural organization and change, landscape theory, and the organization and exercise of power by both state and non-state actors. Please join me in welcoming Kathleen Morrison. Thank you, it's great to be here. Um, let me just go ahead and get started and maybe um, somewhere partway through the talk, you can get a sense of why it is that an archaeologist has somehow been drawn in, in my own research, into discussions over the um, efficacy of large dam projects in, in, in India. Um, because there is actually, oddly enough, a connection. What we see here is a picture of um, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first independent um, prime, prime minister of independent India. In 1954, speaking at the inauguration um, of a large dam, the Bakra Nangal project, um, and this is what he's saying um, as the photo is being taken. He said, what a stupendous, magnificent work, a work that only a nation can take up with, which has faith and boldness. It's become a symbol of the nation's will to march forward with strength, determination, and courage. As I walked around the dam site, I thought that these days the biggest temple and mosque and Gurdwara is the place where man works for the good of mankind. What a place is this, this Bakra Nangal, where thousands and lakhs of men have worked, have shed their blood and their sweat and laid down their lives as well. Where can be a greater and holier place than this, which we can regard as higher? So we, I want to begin then by thinking about the ways in which large dam projects in the context of modern India have been conceived and the ways in which conflicts over large dams um, resonate with different actors in the context of, of India in particular in, in different ways that have led to a very polarized situation um, uh, in, in the present. So given this context, I want to ask, how can we think about contemporary conflict over dam building um, in modern India? And I think that we have to begin by recognizing first that the appeal, uh, particularly the official appeal, that is appeal to governments and large institutions um, of dams and other large projects as well, but dams in particular, as we'll see, runs really very deep. And there are a number, I mean, we could give a, give a whole discussion about this, but there are a number of sort of relevant variables to think about. The first is that the in great enthusiasm for construction of dam building in India is very much cast as a kind of nationalist project, as a reaction to a release from more than 200 years of colonial rule. However, it's important to realize that most of the large dam projects we're going to talk about today, including the Bakranangal project, were actually begun under um, the British uh, prior, to the, prior to independence in 1947. Okay. But it's particularly salient, I think, that one of the, um, colon one of the actions of the, co the colonizers was to suppress indigenous Indian industry um, and the assertion of a kind of industrial power by India was, it, and still is, seen very much as a kind of anti-colonial response, right? So most famously, the British suppressed um, the, the world-famous textile industries of, of India. So as a kind of response to that, it's very important. 
the mid 20th century, not just in India, but in many places, was an era of great enthusiasm for science and for modernism. The TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, was taken as a model for the construction of a lot of the big Indian dam projects. Um, and at the same time, they were part of Soviet-style five-year plans, sort of development plans for the nation. So India was, for those of you who know the history of India in the tw early 20th century, mid-20th century, trying to chart a new course as an independent nation in between two superpowers, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and took inspiration really from both, you might say. Um, India has also had um, some significant historical experiences with famines until the 1970s. In, as a country, India was an importer, net importer of food. Now India is an exporter of food, a fact of which they're very proud. And in many ways, in many um, areas, um, the extension of irrigation and the whole package of green revolution products was seen as the kind of savior um, of the nation in terms of food production. That's an assertion which is very much open to debate, and we can talk about that, but that's always lurking in discussions of big dams. And then finally, the last point that I just want to begin with is historical legacies on this slide, and that's something that has been more um, relating to my own work, and that is not much discussed, but there's actually a very long historical tradition in South Asia um, of construction of very complicated and very large irrigation facilities. So even though big dams, as we're talking about them, are very much products of the 20th and 21st century, they're products of engineering and science, there is a much longer historical legacy of engineering works um, related to, to agriculture in South Asia. And that history is, I will argue and have argued in, in some publications, relevant to understanding contemporary debate. So we have more than a thousand years of dam building in India. And those um, facilities are very much associated with ideas about political rule, with the association with just rule. Right, so that's something that we, we have to keep in mind. Okay, so the first question one might ask is something like, well, does India actually need all of these big dams? Does India need dams? Well, India certainly needs food and power. There's no question about that, right? India has um, a population of more than one billion right now. The population is growing. It's set to pass up China, kind of a dubious honor, I think. Um, but... Um, that in a country where rainfall is very unevenly distributed, there are very dry areas and very wet areas, a large place, there's very significant variability in rainfall temporally as well because it's a monsoonal pattern. And so for farmers, the, the possibility of storage of water is always extremely important. Even where there's sufficient annual rainfall for crop production, it's got to be timed the right way so that you can actually produce the food that you need. And it will be no surprise to you that in India there's a large population living at or below the poverty line. And in the World Bank poverty estimate that I have up here, the India, it's a little hard to read, the, the triangle, the graph with the little triangles, the second one down, is an estimate of the percent of people whose poverty is below $1.25 a day. All right. Luckily, that's a graph that's going down, and that's a positive development for sure. Um, the Indian government keeps changing the estimates for the poverty line, so there's a little bit of jiggling involved in this. But there, it is, in general, an optimistic sort of trend, let's say. Power, on the other hand, is the other sort of very important factor when we're talking about big dams. Um, there's a growing portion of pro proportion of people living in cities, and um, though many of those people are increasingly affluent. So the last 20 years has seen a phenomenal growth in the Indian middle class. Right? So there are many, many more people who have expectations of lifestyles much more like first world lifestyles, and that takes a lot of power. Rural electrification is really fairly well um, established in India, and the extraction of groundwater for, for irrigation from deep bore wells with electric pumps is becoming increasingly important. And to run electric pumps, to irrigate crops, you've got to have electricity. Okay? India itself has no natural oil or gas resources. 
So it's certainly the case that India needs power and water, but does India need big dams? And this is an issue that's created absolute polarization. So the situation right now is one in, of sort of black and white, or white and black. There's a subtle message of my PowerPoint, right? Um, on the one hand, we have uh, the state, both local and national governments, and middle-class affluent urbanites, for the most part. And those are the people who are very much in favor of the construction of large dams. Not surprisingly, these are also the people with the most power, right? So contemporary India is one of the most active dam-building countries in the world, and has been, I would say, for hundreds, uh, if not a thousand years. There are many large projects currently underway. I'll just very briefly talk about one of them. And what we see is that notwithstanding the existence of really significant um, opposition um, to dams on the part of the um, public, there's quite a lot of political will sh shown at the state and national level. And we can see this, for example, in the um, Narmada project, which I'll talk about just briefly, um, in which popular protests did finally cause the World Bank to pull out of the project and withdraw their financial support. You would have think that would have killed the project, but it didn't. The state governments actually came up with the money in the project's proceeding. Okay. So there's a significant, it's not solely a kind of World Bank IMF twisting India's arm saying you've got to have big dams. That's not exactly what's going on here, right? We have local politicians and urbanites who are very enthusiastic about the possibilities. On the other side of the picture, we have really significant local protests, particularly grassroots protests. I would say a very impressive type by farmers, landless laborers, and the poor. There have been numerous court challenges. Unfortunately, India's court system is incredibly backed up. Um, there's a significant international pressure and, of course, millions of academic studies, um, including my own, but which you know, seem to do very little on that side disturbingly. Okay, so we'll just mention right now the most contentious of all of the large projects underway has got to be the Narmada Valley project. The Narmada River is in western India. It's a sacred river, as are so many. Um, the Narmada project has been underway for more than 20 years. Um, there's many stops and starts based on um, issues of funding and court challenges and so on, but it's continuing. There are more than 30 major dams um, constructed or planned to be constructed along the Narmada, over, over 1,000 dams in total. Um, and what we see is a very interesting situation politically. Like many of these kinds of situations, the area is politically divided into different states, and most of the power and water will be benefit the state of Gujarat on the west. However, almost all of the people who will be displaced by the construction of reservoirs are from um, the state of Madhya Pradesh. There are an estimated about 1.5 million people who will be displaced by the construction of dams here. And of those, as they say in India, the oustees, people who are or dam-affected persons, also DAPs, but the oustees are disproportionately the poor and landless, and in particular, people um, of the indigenous peoples, the Adivasis, and people, a uh, low caste people known as Dalits. All right. um, there ha were never any environmental studies made um, prior to the construction, um, and as yet, there's still no rehabilitation plan in place for the um, rehabilitation of oustees. Okay. So what we see is a plan for massive transformations along this major river basin. The Namada project in particular has um, generated a huge amount of protest. It was the impetus for the formation um, of a protest group, Narmada Bachao Andalan, which means something like um, the Save the Narmada movement. And this group, like others, has had... On the one hand, some marked success. They were able, they've re generated a lot of international attention. They were able to get the World Bank to pull out and so on. They have tremendous international sympathy. On the other hand, they really haven't been successful, actually, in getting their neurotic projects stopped. Um, led by a very dynamic leader, Medo Patkar, 
the um, Narmada Bacho Andalan has quite effectively, or I say moderately effectively, deployed forms of protest against the Indian government, really, that were developed during the independence movement. So these are forms of nonviolent protest. Um, dharnas or sort of sit-ins, hunger, hunger strikes, um, you know, willingness to sacrifice one's own life. So people whose villages are going to be submerged will sit with the uh, members of the movement and just let the water come up over them and things like that. So, I mean, it's, it makes for dramatic political theater and they say they have had some success, but not on a, you know, not the ultimate success, let's say. Okay. In response to really widespread um, crit- criticism of, the, of dam projects in general and of specific large dam projects like the Narmada project, the government of India and its uh, governments of India and the kind of pro dam lobby always point to the Bakra Nangal project. This is the project that I opened with, showing Nehru in a very stirring historical moment, talking about big dams in terms of the importance of, da- t- of these facilities to the, to the new nation, and even using the phrase that you saw in the second slide. Dams are the new temples of India, where I worship. All right, a fairly extreme kind of phrase. The Bakra Pro- Nangal project, like another one, the Tungabhadra project I'm going to mention, was begun in the late 1940s, um, mid, mid 1940s, prior to independence in 1947. It was finished, it was inaugurated in the 50s, but it, construction actually went on into the 60s. Um, and it's, the dam itself is located in Himachal Pradesh, fairly high up, but it serves primarily the states of Punjab, Haryana, and Rajasthan. Right? This is relevant insofar as we always have this kind of problem right, in river developments where one group makes the sacrifices for the benefit of others. Right? So we always have a kind of rhetoric of sacrifice. And in the case of the Bakra project in particular, Nehru even said to the Austies, you know, something like, you should be, you know, if you must suffer, at least you can suffer for your country. And the idea of suffering for one's own independent country country was something people were actually proud to do, right? Um, 36,000 people officially were displaced by the Bakra Nangal project. Um, And the lands of a former independent princely state, Bilasapur state, were primarily, uh, were the largest part of the lands flooded. So for many years, the idea of this dam was tossed about in British India, but it was a difficult situation politically because the area to be flooded was not part of British India. It was part of an independent princely state. The ruler of that state was not keen, really, on having a huge part of his lands um, flooded. But once that state was absorbed into the newly independent Indian nation, the, the difficulty disappeared. So Bakra, as we said, is always seen as kind of an icon of progress and a kind of success story um, of dams in India. It's the highest concrete gravity dam in Asia, or that may be wrong now because there may be, um, I think, some of the Chinese dams are bigger. It it does generate hydroelectric power. And in Punjab, particularly, and in Haryana, two northern states in India, um, there is... The area served by the Bakra Dam and its its system is an area that's traditionally seen as kind of the breadbasket of India. It's a very highly productive area where they grow intensively grow wheat and rice using high yielding varieties and the whole green revolution package: tractors, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and so on. All right. Much of the agriculture in other parts of India, um, and I work in the south, not in this area, is not like that at all, right? So here we have this very highly industrialized kind of green revolution package. And there's uh, an official line, you might say, that, see, this is great. Look how well it's working. This is a sign that India is now independent in food grains. Big dams work. We need more big dams, okay? So Bakra is very important as a kind of an icon of the nation and of progress. All right. But how can we evaluate these arguments? On the one hand, we have people who say big dams are the worst thing ever. On the other hand, people are saying the big dams are the best thing ever. I mean, surely it ought to be possible to understand um, how well uh, dams have worked. 
One way to look at it is to look at um, examples historically. That is to say, we have thousands, tens of thousands of dams across India, anywhere from 600 to 60 years old. Let's look at the historical experiences of these facilities and of the people who've lived around them and used them and see what we can learn from the past. So what I've done really is this, and I'm just giving you kind of a synopsis of it in this talk, is look at two sets, uh, two data sets really. On the left, I've looked at the Bakran Nangal project, this super iconic, famous project where Nehru made all these famous quotes, and the Tungabhadra project, which is in, in southern India, in Karnataka, where I do my own research. Both of those dams, there's a picture of the Tungabhadra um, dam at the bottom on the left there, were built, begun prior to independence and finished after independence. So these are mid-20th century dams about 60 years old. Right? On the other hand, um, I've also done a huge amount of research looking at me medieval dams and reservoirs in South India. These are anywhere from the 10th to 16th century, so they're anywhere from you know, 600 to 1,000 years old. All right? Um, and some of these facilities were actually quite large. It's a 16th century reservoir still in use in the lower right-hand corner. So it's not a completely archaic exercise in the sense that these things are still part of a living agricultural landscape. So if we look at the historical experience of these kinds of dams and reservoirs, what can we learn? All right. A brief excursion, I say, to try and convince you that studying these ancient reservoirs actually has something to say about the present. Um, in, south, in southern, all across southern India and Sri Lanka, reservoirs with dams, here's, um, a, this one's dry, but you can see the dam there with a little sluice gate, a very cute little sluice gate on the right. It looks like a little temple, actually. It's got this sweet little roof. Um, there you can see me and one of my students standing up on the dam. But these things were thousands, tens of thousands of them, all across southern India and Sri Lanka. They're very highly elaborated there are some large and some small. And the impacts of these reservoirs, as we'll see, were comparable to those of modern ones, right? There are ecological effects, there are social effects, and there are what we call cultural logics of reservoirs. That is, what people think about them and why they make them and what they mean to them. Some of these kinds of things are similar from the past to the present, and I think that there are lessons to be learned from that. Okay. So what, in terms of the research that I've done, I won't go into it in any detail at all. Here are some two older, um, both 14th and 16th century reservoirs, um, both still in use. The one on the bottom is not in very good shape. You can just see these little scrappy bits of water. This is a dry season. Um, but what we've done is we've studied a whole landscape full of agricultural facilities. We've looked at how and why and by whom reservoirs were built. We've looked at their histories on the landscape, how they were constructed, how they were maintained and abandoned, patterns of siltation and sediment inflow, so kind of the hydrology and the geomorphology of them. And allied to that, um, my, my students and I have looked at regional vegetation histories. So we've looked at patterns of erosion and valley floor siltation that are caused by deforestation. We've looked at the way in which agricultural facilities are integrated into settlements, networks, road market, markets, and so on. Okay? So this is all, I suppose, just meant to sort of assert that we do have um, a kind of well-studied historical baseline for talking about the performance of both older and newer reservoirs. Okay, so what have we really learned then from both more recent, sort of 1940s plus, and more ancient irrigation facilities? Well, it's kind of interesting because what we see is the story is one that should be very familiar to critics of modern dams. All right? the, the problems of mo mo large dams are many, and they, they include environmental problems, um, submergence of forests and other ecosystems, to huge problems of siltation behind the dam, um, to microenvironmental effects on climate. All of these are you know, well-known problems with large dams. We see this also in the middle period reservoirs. These are sluice gates from middle period reservoirs, completely silted in, two to three meters worth of silt, so they were made, rendered useless. Um, this is, and what we find is that middle period reservoirs also have a very high rate of failure. 
Um, the large dams often um, are associated with water pollution and the expansion of invasive plants. They can be associated with water logging and salinization of the command area, which decreases um, agricultural productivity. That's kind of a problem, and since the whole idea of the dam in some ways is to improve agricultural productivity. And what we see when we look at the Tungabhadra project is a, indeed some of those very things. We see um, an a, uh, environment created that's conducive to the expansion of um, invasive water hyacinth and other invasive plants. And we see some serious salinization and water logging in this area caused by this um, 20th century dam that are affecting modern farmers in a quite significant way. Um, people studying the Bakra project, too, have seen serious problems of salinization and water logging. The human consequences of large dam construction are a little bit more sort of easy to understand, perhaps, um, the inundation of large areas covers up people's villages and their homes. It also covers up sacred places like temples. You can see the top of a temple peeping, peeping out of the water here. It's part of the Narmada project. And generally what we see is very unequal distribution of water, right? So that some people, particularly those nearer the dam, and often those, gosh, surprisingly, with political clout, end up with the access to land and water that's most reliable nearby at the top part of a canal, and the so-called tail enders or downstream people very often end up with not enough water to do agricultural uh, production at all. And although many of these projects, both the Tungabhadra project and the Bakra project, were intended to be um, protection against a famine, so they're what the Indian government refers to as protective works. They're meant to be supplemental irrigation for food crops, especially subsistence production. What, in fact, we actually see is intensive commercial production of sugar cane and rice and other things like that that are making a lot of money for some people and actually reduced access to water for other people who are suffering. So the inequalities and the inequities seem to be exacerbated. Okay. Come on. We see a similar situation um, in the earlier periods, right? Even as you know, early as the 14th century, you build a reservoir, you build a dam, something's going to be covered up. So inundation, even in this period, caused loss of fields, loss of grazing land. And even as um, early as the 16th century, we can see that canals, canal water was primarily used to water cash crops in commercial production, not for enhanced subsistence. So there doesn't seem to have been a kind of golden age in the past where everybody was sharing and production was more equitable and everything was just nice and much better, um, unfortunately, as um, some of the critics of big dams would have it. Right. So what we can see is that construction and maintenance of facilities and the use of water has always been political, right? So it, it, that gives us some sense that, you know, it's always, always going to be, I think. It doesn't necessarily mean it's impossible. The Bakra Nongal project, too, we can look, you know, we got a 60-year record of this iconic dam, and we can see, um, this is not my own study, but this is someone else's, um, really some significant problems. 50 years later, the displaced people have not been fully resettled, and in fact, the government of Himachal Pradesh just in 2006 came up with a new plan to, to help um, some of those who were, were ousted. Only the people who owned land were at, compensated at all, so landless laborers who depended on areas that were um, inundated received nothing. And the loss of soil fertility and the kind of move towards the whole Green Revolution package has meant um, changes in soil fertility that have, you know, basically obviated the possibility of any kind of subsistence production whatsoever. So this package involves significant technological input. And even here, in the, even in the Punjab, which is one of the richest, most fertile parts of India, where and uh, is sort of always seen as the best place to be an agriculturalist in India, you're seeing a tremendous rates of rural indebtedness to you know, buy seeds, to buy fertilizer, and all that sort of thing requires cash. Um, and as a consequence of expanding rural debt, there's been a rash of farmer suicides. Few, few people were, well, I mean, everyone was horrified. Few were surprised, perhaps, when there was a rash of farmer suicide in Andhra Pradesh, which is a very dry area among cotton farmers. This is a funeral pyre of a, a Punjabi farmer who committed suicide because of um, spiraling out of control debt. 
All right. Pub- large dams also um, have various kinds of safety and public health issues, um, particularly working as vectors for waterborne disease, and, of course, there's always the risk of catastrophic dam failure. Um, we see the expansion of waterborne diseases in both the medieval and the Tungabhadra project area, expansion of malaria as early as the 19th century, and just most recently the expansion of uh, dengue and chikungunya, and I can tell you those are not pleasant because I got them. Um, dam failure was common in the older reservoirs, the 16th century Daroji Reservoir breached in 1851, flooding the village and killing several people. Every single reservoir just about that I've studied has been broken or breached several times. Just to tell you that it's not only something that happened a long time ago, last year a dam in Kerala breached. Luckily, there was not um, significant loss of human life. Um, and I just want to close then, finally, I've got, I think I have less than, less than zero seconds, um, by saying that we have to understand the problems of large dams, both in terms of the generic problems. I mean, the, list, the litany I've given you, the list of issues, apply to every large dam, really. The environmental problems, the human problems, those are general, right? But what we see in every case also are... Sp- specific issues. Every site is unique, and in every location there are unique kinds of pressures, political, cultural, and other sort of pressures, both for and against. And I think that one thing that people have not thought about much in the case of India is the kind of cultural logic of reservoirs. The Nehruvian logic, you might say, of science, progress, the nation, that has been much discussed, right? But People have always been a bit baffled by why Nehru, such a secular guy, would say something like dams are the temples of modern India, right? Then they meant it to, and often has been understood as a kind of anti religious, anti Gandhian notion, right? But if we look into the past, we can see that in some ways, reservoirs have always been the the temples of India. Here's that cute little sluice gate I showed you before. On the bottom, there's a, it's got a matching temple. It's actually very adorable. 15th century um, reservoir and um, little matching temple. So reservoirs have always been associated with just political rules, rule. Even 600 years ago, a good king was one who provided irrigation for his subjects, right? So I'm not saying that Nehru was trying to be a good Hindu king exactly, but that there's a kind of cultural resonance here which we would um, you know, be wise to be aware of, okay? So let me just close to then by saying, well, what are the alternatives to big dams? The alternatives to big dams have often been suggested to be the resurrection of the traditional irrigation systems. And as someone who actually has studied these traditional irrigation systems, um, I would agree with a great deal of caution. That is to say that these are not uniformly successful, so we need to learn when they worked and when they didn't work and why. And furthermore, they have always been power-laden technologies, right? Irrigation facilities, even in the past, have always been associated with unequal benefits and risks, right? So the idea that um, sort of pre-modern or traditional systems are um, associated with community management and so on, which is an incredibly powerful notion in South Asia, is actually just plain wrong, Right? But to say that doesn't mean that there is no solution to the problem. Right? We can still have small-scale facilities. We can still rejuvenate some of the traditional facilities, but we have to do it in a smart way. We have to do it in a way that actually takes into account the differential success and failure of these uh, features in the past and that recognizes their intrinsically politicized nature and realize that what we have to do is forge new ways of dealing with these things and not go back to a kind of mythical golden age that never really existed.